All righty. Good morning. My name is Pastor Dave. I just about put my coffee up here. That would have been a bad idea, so I'm not going to do that. I'm thankful, though, that Christina brought me coffee because coffee is one of God's great gifts to humanity. <laughs> so I'm opening my Bible to Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 9. Uh, quick update before we get into the word. Uh, we have a worship director search team that is in process, and we invite your prayers for that. We're excited. The Lord is uh, giving us opportunities. Uh, folks have applied, so that's the first thing we're thankful for. Uh, but we want you to know that we are earnestly pursuing that. Uh, Ashley, who transitioned back to Foundations, um, she, uh, having gone, we're now looking at uh, finding a person not only to step into what she's been doing, but also to long-term be bringing us all together as one church in our worship. And so we're looking for a person with a broad skill set. Some people have called this person a unicorn, you know, needle in a haystack, whatever you want to say. But, uh, but uh, the Lord is blessing us. So your prayers are very appreciated as we do that. Uh, you're welcome to ask questions, and we will share what we can share. So... Uh, we're, we're digging into the word in Matthew chapter 9, and as we, as we look at it, we're going to see Jesus in the midst of folks who have become entrenched in a certain way of doing religion, of doing life with God and one another. And I think back on my early days as a Christian, I became a Christian in youth group when I was 17, and when I look back on it, within a year, I myself was already becoming entrenched in ways of doing religion ways of doing Christianity that, as I look back on it, we're missing the point. <laughs> we're missing out on what God had for me and for his people. I was in a youth group that was very committed to proclaiming the gospel to folks who had no opportunity to hear it outside of that opportunity. They bust in kids from the city that was close to us, St. Joseph, Missouri. It's in Northwest Missouri. And they would bus kids Kids whose parents, maybe they knew where they were going and they were glad they were going to a church where there'd be some good influence, perhaps. Uh, little did they know. But also, they were, uh, some of them didn't have parents who cared. So they're just sending their kids wherever, you know. They have no positive influence necessarily at home. But within a year of me being in a, a youth group, me being a person who knew my great need of a Savior, how sinful I was, and how incredible the grace of the gospel was, on offer to me, within a year, I already felt like all those kids coming to youth group were taking attention away from people like me, who was serious about my faith, getting to grow. I, I should be able to grow in my discipleship. We should be more focused on helping people like me grow. Me and my friends and my friend group. We need to be more focused on, on this because we're serious and we're here. And, you know, and we'd point our fingers at the kids who just came because they liked the pizza, you know? Not realizing that the Lord gave us an incredible opportunity to get to share his love with these dear people who are coming. Not seeing with his eyes. And I missed the point. I did it again in college. I went on a summer mission project. It's called a mission project. But again, I missed the point. It was with Campus Crusade for Christ. It was in Vail, actually. It was, uh, and so they trained students who were going to be working mostly in secular places to uh, learn to love their neighbors where they are in their workplaces because that's going to be your primary mission field for most people. And so I was working at the Red Lion Inn. Maybe you've been there. It's just right off the slopes. And so I'm working there. But I felt like this time I'm spending there is just a waste of my time. I should be out preparing for the Bible study I'm going to leave. I should, I, I lead. I should be, you know, investing in these other people in our, in our group. And again, I miss the point. I miss these people right around me and the opportunity the Lord was giving me to invite them in. I don't know when it clicked. I don't know the moment. But there was some point at which I realized... Oh, no. <laughs> I was already becoming just like the Pharisees. Many of us think that it takes years and decades and that it's not the college age and it's not the youth group student who's going to become entrenched. It's other people, right? 
The less trendy, the less, the less hip who will become entrenched. But no. <laughs> well, at least it was me. I could miss the point. In the first century, there were people who were missing the point of what God was doing in Jesus. And ultimately, that's going to lead to Jesus being crucified. We've seen the beginning of the opposition that he's experiencing from the Pharisees. He's just healed a man and forgiven his sins, remember? And that blows all the categories for the Pharisees and first century Jews because only God can do that. And Jesus is coming in their midst. He's not paying credence to their rules and the regulations, to the, the things they've added to God's word. He's, he's saying, you've heard it said, but now I'm saying to you. And he's speaking with an authority that doesn't kowtow to their ways, the way things have always been. And he's meeting with people that they hate and offering God's love to them. He's meeting with people of other cultures, Samaritans. He's spending time with tax collectors, an occupation that is more than an occupation. This is more than like lawyer jokes. Forgive me if you're a lawyer. This is more than, you know, something like parking attendants who in, in, in college, I had a friend who was a parking attendant on our campus and I felt betrayed because how could you do that? But this is more than that, right? A cultural hatred and betrayal that they felt toward folks who were tax collectors. And Jesus is offering his love to them in the midst of all of that. And Jesus is ignoring all the rules about who you spend time with and where you spend time with them and how you eat with them or don't eat with them. He says, you've heard all that stuff, but now I'm saying something new. And people are missing out on what God is doing. The question for us is, will we... <laughs> Or will we take hold and see that Jesus, what, why, we've been talking about why he matters today. Why does he matter today? Why did he matter in the first century? Because he came to give good news for sinners. <laughs> Simple as that. Jesus came to give good news for sinners. And that even includes me and you and our neighbors that we don't think would ever come to the Lord or the people that we would never ourselves want to go to. And people, perhaps today, if you're here, who would say, I never want to have anything to do with Jesus because I've seen those Pharisees and I've experienced them and I don't want anything to do with that. I just invite you today, if, if that's you, if that's where you're at, if you're in any of those categories, Jesus is going to be calling to you from this passage. He's still calling today. He still speaks by his word. He's here with us. I believe, and he would meet you today. So I just invite you to be receptive, even if that's difficult. So let's pray, and then we'll, we'll dive in. Father, thank you that the Lord Jesus is here in our midst. I pray that he would speak. Lord, help us uh, to put down our defenses for what he might have to say to us. Help us to be expectant that he might actually say something we need to hear Something lovely, something true, something challenging, something that gives life. Make us ready. Help us to receive and be changed. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus matters today because he came to give good news for sinners. And we see in verses 9 to 13, we see that with the story of Matthew, who elsewhere is called Levi. You see verse 9. Jesus is passing on. He's been in Capernaum, and he just healed this paralyzed man. And now he, what does he see? He saw a man called Matthew. Interesting. In other places where this story is shared in Mark and in Luke, pay attention to what Jesus saw. In Mark 2.14, Jesus saw Levi the son of Alphaeus. He saw a person with a family history. He saw someone's son, Levi. That's his name after all, Levi. It's a very common Jewish name. It's perhaps one of the top three in the extent archeological, easy for you to say, archeological remains uh, from the day. Very common Jewish name. And put this together, Levi, is sitting in a tax booth. So immediately you know 
if you're reading this, and certainly if you were there, you would feel it. Jesus is doing something shocking in the verses that follow. Because he doesn't see Levi. He doesn't see Matthew the way we would see him if we were in the first century religious crowd. We would try to walk far around. We would probably give some serious laser eyes, throw in some serious shade over at Levi in the tax booth because he's probably, likely, we can at least say likely, fleecing his fellow people, taking more than he needs to take. It was a common practice in his day. And at the very least, he's allied with Rome, an occupying force. You think we have political enmity in our day, but we are not an occupied people under an oppressive regime. The Jewish people hated the Romans and longed for the true king to come. <laughs> well, here's Jesus. And when he comes, he sees this man, this Levi, the son of Alphaeus. Luke sees, uh, when Jesus sees uh, Levi in Luke 5.27, he sees a tax collector. He sees his occupation, a tax collector named Levi. But in Matthew, and this perhaps is one of the reasons why from early times in church history, folks believe this is the gospel according to Matthew. This is his accounting because he's sharing his own story. He was seen. And Jesus passed on from there and he saw a man called Matthew. He saw a human being. He saw someone that the Lord treasures, created in God's image. He saw not only what that person was, someone's son, a Jewish person who is serving the Romans in this occupation of tax collector. He not only saw him and saw his name, Levi, he saw who he would become. Matthew sounds like the word for disciple or apprentice. He saw Levi right where he was. This person who probably wanted nothing to do with the God of his fellow Pharisees and Sadducees, the scribes, because they were mean to him. <laughs> they assumed the worst about him, even if he was the worst. He doesn't want anything to do with that. And the people looking on don't want anything to do with him. But Jesus comes and sees him and calls him to follow him. And what does he do? He gets up and he follows him. Why? Because he was seen by the Son of God. <laughs> and he was called and welcomed. And he couldn't say no. Today, you may be here and you may be like the Pharisees a little bit. You're like me. It's, it can be pretty bad being a professional religious person in terms of what it can do to your heart, particularly your heart toward the people Jesus loves that the religious culture will tell you not to love, something that we have to check ourselves against. But we might ask like the Pharisees, why does your teacher eat with the tax collectors and sinners? Why, why are you busing in all the kids from the city? Why are you spending so much time with coworkers who don't love the Lord? Why? <laughs> you know? And, and we think that all of those things are taking away from our purity or from our growth or from our personal spiritual experience. But when Jesus hears those kinds of questions, he says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, he speaks like the wisdom sage that he is. And then he speaks like a prophet, quoting Hosea 6.6, 6, verse 13. Learn what this means. Go learn what this means, he says. And he's not telling them, hear this, he's not telling them to go and re-memorize Hosea 6.6, because 6, they probably already have it memorized. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. He's not saying just go do a Bible study on it. He's, he's calling them to apprehend again what that means for them. The Lord, and, and, and this word for mercy, I desire mercy. The, the word is translating a Hebrew word, hesed. Steadfast love. I desire steadfast love. I de desire you to love me, the Lord says to his people. And I desire you to experience my love for you so that you'd share it for other people. Remember 
throughout the story of God's people. They weren't the people of the right theology. They weren't the people who had it all together. They were slaves in Egypt who had forgotten their Lord. And the Lord came and redeemed them out of Egypt. Slaves that they were, not because they were great, not because there was anything special about them, but because of his love for them. Because of his promise that he always keeps. So he takes them out of Egypt. And they're not the people of the perfect theology. They're the people that would make a golden calf and bow before it and call it the Lord. They're the people that turn away from the Lord time and time again. They're the people that forget where they came from. The people who had no home, who had no status. And the Lord gave them a home and gave them a status as children of God. A light in the world, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The Lord gave them that. And they would forget again and again. Go and learn what this means. The Lord's great love for you. I don't just want you in your sacrifice. I don't just want you in your coming to church. I don't just want you in your memorizing scripture. I don't just want you in your reading big tomes of theology. I just, I, you know, do you hear what I'm saying? Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying theology isn't important. I'm not saying Bible memory is not important and helpful. And transforming when we do it to the Lord for his glory, hungering and thirsting for him. But you know what I mean, don't you? <laughs> we can forget that we have great need of this Savior who came for us. And we can say that person has no hope. There's never going to be a moment when that person will come to the Lord. They've turned away from it. And so here today, right now, the Lord is putting his thumb on you. If you have a person in your, in your life, a coworker, a family member, someone you say will never come to the Lord. They would never. They're, they're way outside of reach. They wouldn't want anything to do with him. And maybe you don't want anything to do with him. Hold, give Bach a minute. He, 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 let, let, let's put him, put him back for a second. We'll get to Bach. And his wig. But the Lord, the Lord, once he sets sight on somebody he wants, there's nothing that will separate him. And there's nothing that will stand between him and his beloved. And that person you think that would never come to the Lord, once he fixes his eyes on them and they see him, they're being seen by him, they're going to give themselves because you know Jesus. Remember the one who's loved you. Remember the steadfast love of God for you. <laughs> when he takes hold, there's no one who's too far. And if you're a not ever today, you can bring Bach back now. If you're a not ever, and you think, I don't want anything to do with those religious people, those people like the Pharisees, who say, I've got to follow God in their exact way. And if I don't do it in their exact way, then God wants nothing to do with me. And since I don't want to do things in their exact way, obviously there's no hope for me. And I should just ignore all that stuff and go about with my life because there's just no hope for me in God. Jesus is showing something different here. And I would challenge you, if you reject Christianity, if you reject Jesus, because of the Pharisees, because of people like me, you're getting off too easy. It's, it's kind of like there's a, a, a New Testament theologian named John Dixon. He made a video called How to Judge the Church. It's kind of a funny title, How to Judge the Church. And in the video, it begins with someone playing cello, a professional cellist, and he's playing one of Bach's cello suites in G major, something that you would know. You've heard it before. It's beautiful. It's warm perfect the way it's being played. But then John, this theologian by trade, he spends about a week learning the basics of cello and learns the basic melody of Bach's cello suite in G major and sits on the stage after the professional and starts trying to hack away at the cello and, you know, and it's, it's pretty rough. It's not pleasant. And the thing that he brings out in this video the thing I invite you to consider today is when you are turning away from Christianity because 
of how badly some of us live it out, it's, it's kind of like rejecting the composer, probably one of the greatest composers who's ever lived, on the basis of a bad performance hundreds of years later. Do you hear what I'm saying? Jesus gave us a melody so much more beautiful even than one of Bach's cello suites. He lived it for us. He gave himself. God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. And if you just would look on him, would believe in him, you, you won't perish. You won't live a meaningless life. You'll have eternal life, full life with him. And that's the invitation, is to know him. And so I just invite you to let yourself be seen by Jesus. And if you don't feel like that's happened yet, would you take a risk to keep looking until that moment happens and your gazes meet? There's no not ever with Jesus. And folks, maybe who are not yet, you can keep walking with us. You don't have to agree with all of our theology to be here with us. You don't have to have a theology to be with us. You may just be picking up a Bible for the first time. You maybe never have. But Jesus is compelling and you wonder, you can be here. And the rest of us have to deal with it. And more than that, we have to learn to love and remember where we were. Folks who are all readies, though, Jesus is going to have some, some words with us in this next portion. Those who may even be the good old boys and girls of the church, the folks who have been in youth group for a year, and we're the leaders now, the folks who have been in the church for a while. He's going to have some words for us. Starting in verse 14, Jesus not only has good news of welcome for sinners, he also has this good news of wine, a new wine. And when the disciples of John came to him, you remember John the baptizer, he's out in the wilderness, he's eating locusts and wild honey, very serious in his pursuit of God. And his disciples fast. In, in some of the early manuscripts, it says, a lot. Why do we and the Pharisees fast a lot? You can imagine the exhaustion from them. We're, we're fasting a lot. And you guys aren't. That's kind of frustrating for us. And so, why is that? Jesus says to them, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Well, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they'll fast. This is, for the record, the first place Jesus foreshadows the fact that he's come to die. The bridegroom will be taken away. And there will be a time to fast. Jesus teaches about when you fast in Matthew 6. There's a time to fast, and we live in that age. We learn to discipline our affections. We learn to make our chief hunger and thirst be for the Lord as we fast. But there's a time to celebrate. And Jesus being with you was a time to celebrate. If you could imagine being uh, in, involved in planning for a wedding and everything that went into that, and then right before the wedding, one of the family members says, you know, I'm not going to come to the reception. I'm not going to eat with you guys because I think I'm going to do South Beach diet. I, I think I'm going to lose 30 pounds, you know, get ready for summer, look good in my, you know, my swimsuit. So I don't really want to eat all that stuff. And join you guys. So you guys can do that though. It's selfish. And not only is it selfish, it's also keeping you from getting to experience the incredible joy of being in the party. You're standing outside looking in. Jesus is inviting the Pharisees to come into the party. The disciples of John with all their seriousness about discipleship to come in and celebrate what God is doing. And not miss out. And then he gives a, a few more pictures. And here's where I want to just take care for a moment that I explain. It's good for us always to recognize when we're reading scripture, which I believe is authoritative and is the word of God. It's inspired by God. It's profitable for us. It's important to know when we're reading scripture and when we're interpreting it and applying it. Right? 
There's scripture, there's theology, there's scripture, there's application. Tracking with me right now? Well, Jesus says some things that are a little bit difficult to interpret. I think we can handle them. And I'm going to suggest an application. But I invite you as people who look to Jesus, who have the Holy Spirit in you, who have critical thinking skills, to apply them yourself and think about it yourself. See what you do with this. So starting in verse 16, he's, he's addressing this question of fasting and seriousness about discipleship when the bridegroom, when Jesus is present. Verse 16, no one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. So the picture, picture it. There's an old garment, you know, one of your old t-shirts, and you wouldn't take unshrunk fabric and put it on the old t-shirt because... In time, it'll tear away. That's the picture. Jesus didn't come to simply put a patch on the ways and the traditions of the Pharisees or the disciples of John or any other religious movement in the first century. He was coming to offer something new, a whole new garment, a new heaven and a new earth, new wine, So he's not just going to patch the old. And neither is new wine put into old wineskins. So he, picture, he switches from the picture of the garment and the patch to now wine and wineskins. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, the wine spilled, the skins are destroyed, but new wine is put into fresh wineskins. New wine. Jesus is bringing something new, something fresh, something tasty. And as he pours in this new wine, as he sits with sinners and offers them the hope of the kingdom of heaven, as he is meeting with people across cultural barriers, as he has food and reclines at table. Picture this, he's reclining at table. The picture isn't sitting at a table like we do. There's not long-legged tables. He's leaning back with his elbow, right? Uh, You know, maybe against a cushion. Perhaps someone next to him leaning against him. We we find in in the upper room in John that that one of Jesus' disciples, the beloved disciple, has his head against Jesus' chest. It, It can get that intimate, that close. And culturally, they're not quite as nervous about that as, as we are. But Jesus is like that with tax collectors, with sinners. And that goes against all of the notions of first century religion. How could you cross all those lines? How could you just go against all of the ways that things have always been? How could you do this? And add to the list, you're not fasting a lot like us. Well, Jesus is bringing something new, something fresh, something good. Salvation for all nations, a welcome unto God, a welcome to be a part of God's people, to people who are sinners. He will call them. They don't have to go through like a 90-day process. They don't have to go through like a step program. No, right now, I see you. You see me. Follow me. You're welcome. And there's no one too far for me, Jesus would say. This is new, and it's beautiful. There was a moment when the Lord reached you. You who are already, who are looking to the Lord in faith, there's a moment when the Lord reached you. And there are ways in which he reached you. The, the gospel message, and this is where I'm taking a step beyond Scripture to application, and so you can see what you want to do with it. But this is what I think. I think when we apply this today, We're not like the first century in every way, but we can be similar. It only took me a little while to add to the gospel, to add to the word of God some expectations for the way his kingdom should work. And to overlook passages like this, where Jesus came, not for the righteous, but for sinners. It only took me a little while. And I think that we can... Have that happened to us as well? And, and even in subtle ways, there, the ways in which the message is communicated to us, kind of like wineskins, 
For us, it was new, it was fresh, but eventually it can become kind of this crust, this old thing that we need to sort of reconsider, maybe even do away with. Some of these things can be things like preferences. It has always been this way. This is the way I like it. This is the way I like to drink Jesus wine. And I don't want to drink it another way. And not only do I not want to, I become suspicious of. I look down on the people who do it differently than me. We're in a contemporary service. I know that makes us hip, open to everything. We're the better ones, you know. And those people that worship with that traditional stuff, they're just stodgy, and you know. Yeah. But the Lord is pouring his wine into them through that means. Sometimes, sometimes, both ways, however you have it, we need to examine that wine skin. Is it getting in the way of the message? Because the gospel will burst anything that tries to hold it in from accomplishing what Jesus came to accomplish. He came to save sinners. Whether they're your parents, whether they're your kids, whether they're somebody in Kenya worshiping Jesus, wearing tribal masks. Jesus came to save sinners and it doesn't always look the same way. It's the same gospel. It's the same wine. It's the same savior. Jesus matters today because he came to save sinners. He tells a story in Matthew 22 of a party. And this is kind of how the story goes. There is a billionaire, a really wealthy person who throws a wedding party for his son who's getting married. And as you can imagine, everybody would want to be at this party. It's going to be huge. And so there's a very exclusive list of elite people that get invited to the party. But here's what happens. All those people that are invited, they start tweeting to one another about this party, you know. They're sharing memes about how ridiculous the, the host is. And not only that, they don't stop there. They actually conspire together to harm him, to do violence against this son who's getting married. And so, naturally, the host of the party is pretty ticked off. He uninvites them. Y'all aren't coming anymore. And, and then he sends out his staff to go and invite anybody and everybody they can find. Everyone, come on in. You're all welcome. Come into this feast and celebrate my son and his wedding. But as they were coming in, everybody's getting a t-shirt. And it's the, you know, it's the wedding, you know, 2022, you know, wedding t-shirt. And everybody's putting on their t-shirt and sitting down. But as the host goes around, he looks and he sees there's a few people who just came for the awesome hors d'oeuvres and the free bar, you know, all day or whatever. But anyway, depending on the kind of wedding you go to. So they're, they're going to the wedding just for the free stuff. And they're not actually interested in the sun. They're not actually interested in the wedding at all. And so the host goes to them and says, where's, where's your t-shirt? They didn't think anything of it. And he says, leave. If you're not here for my son, this isn't for you. What do we do with this story? Jesus is saying that if you experience him, if you experience his kingdom as something that you don't want to be a part of, reaching sinners, you don't want to be a part of reaching those people you think that God would never want, you don't want to be a part of going across cultural lines, putting away your preferences, and submitting them to Jesus. You don't want to go into his party and drink his wine. You want to drink wine the way you want to drink wine. You know, you want to drink grape juice. Anyway. That's another story. But anyway, I shouldn't have gone there. But you don't want to go into Jesus' party. If that's you, I, I, I want you to realize Jesus has a, a very intense challenge for you to look on him again. 
and to remember the love of God for you, to remember when you rejected your parents, to remember when you rejected Jesus and his word and his ways, to remember when you went your own way and how desperately you need his grace today, just like you needed it then. And to come in and to drink of the gospel, taste and see it's good again. You got to see him, see him seeing you again. And if you are just coming because you're thankful for a place where you're welcome, and I hope you experience the welcome of God here. We've been trying to lean into that together, a place where you're loved, a place where you can be known. You just want to come in and enjoy the party and you want to get the Mary's Mountain cookie that's for free when you fill out your card, which is very tasty. If that's you, I just want you to know we don't have anything other than Jesus to offer you. There is no hope apart from him. We're inviting you not to put on the the t-shirt of Faith Church. We we don't really care ultimately about that. We don't care if you embrace our our theology ultimately. We, We care that you put on Christ. That's what we're inviting you to. We're inviting you to drink deeply of him when you come here. That's what every church worth its salt here in Loveland and the world is doing ultimately. We're trying to get you and us and all to see and be seen by Jesus. To come free of charge and drink. Jesus matters today because he came to give good news for sinners. So I invite you to see him, to be seen by him. To take hold of him. He's here. So let's pray, Father. Uh, I thank you that Jesus would be here in the midst of sinners. That includes me. And I pray that you'd help us to, to apprehend his love for us. But not to ignore his invitation and his command to come. To receive to receive every day of his mercy that's new every morning. Help us to receive today and to share it. We ask that in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, We practice something together that we're learning as we follow Jesus. It's a quiet minute or so of listening, asking Jesus, what do you have to say to me? We call it listening to Jesus. We just invite you to take a moment to consider in any of the songs, in any of the readings, in your moments of prayer, in any of the message this morning, what was Jesus saying to you? Just take a quiet minute, and then we'll continue to worship. minister to us in the ways we need. We need your encouragement. We need your comfort as we grieve. We need your challenge as we just sin and sin and run headlong into destruction and folly. So please take hold of us wherever we are today.